الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمد ونشكر ونستعين ونستغفر ونتوب إليه ونشهد إن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد محمد عبده ورسوله رب شرح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم everyone so we've come to the near end of the ICNA convention which alhamdulillah has been such a blessing in so many ways for us to be together, to attend lectures, to seek knowledge, to greet one another. And truly we feel the blessing and the benefit of community after having experienced the absence of the physical presence, the social distancing, the difficulties that we've encountered during COVID. So alhamdulillah, may Allah Azza wa Jal continue to unite us all in the best of health and the best of iman and in the best of ways. And as you head out from this weekend, be sure to stop by and talk to the organizers, the volunteers, those who spend countless hours behind the scenes putting together a program such as this. So when we talk about the topic of culture and we address that conversation together today, we first need to better understand what is culture. We need to define culture and know what it is that we're talking about. So from a denotative definition, if you look up culture in the dictionary, you see that it is essentially a set of shared values, worldviews that are encompassed by several within a community, within a society, within a country, within an ethnic group. And so when we talk about culture here in the US, many times I hear families, I hear parents saying things like, don't copy the American culture. We're not like the Americans and their culture. And this is a problem. Because you, me, our children, their children, we are American. We are Muslim Americans. And being a Muslim American is not a paradox. Being a Muslim American does not go against either of those identities. Because we can we will, we do every day maintain our Islamic identity and take the good from that which surrounds us, that which we are a part of, which is the American culture. Now growing up years ago, I remember in the 80s, early 90s, we used to learn in our social studies class that America was like a melting pot. And the idea of the melting pot was that all of these different cultures from different backgrounds, different places in the world would come together and enter into the United States and create this new culture, a melting pot. Yet to be a melting pot, it is necessitated that each culture gives up part of it. Think of a big pot, a big stew, if you use your crock pot and you throw things inside, what happens? It melds together and sometimes you can't even figure out what that final product is. America is not a melting pot. America is a salad bowl. A salad bowl in which each item comes together, enhances the culture, enhances what it means to be an American without losing sight of who we are in terms of our own backgrounds, our own languages, our own ethnicities, and first and foremost, our faith. So the first conversation that we have to have about culture is recognizing that we cannot shirk or push away the culture of the country in which we reside, in which we raise our children, in which our children and their children and their children view as home. And when we talk to our children, when we talk about our homes and we reference back home, meaning Egypt, Pakistan, Somalia, Palestine, you know, anywhere that is not America, realize that that is not our home, that this country here is our home. And until we take ownership of what it means to be American, what it means to be a Muslim American, until we take ownership of that role, we are going to struggle. And our children are going to struggle. And our young Muhammads are still going to ask their classmates to call them Mike. 
and our young Bilal's are going to go by the name Billy. And our children are going to be one person in their schools, in their sports, outside of the home, and they're going to be a different person within the masajid and within their homes. And we need to stop that. And we need to stop it by first recognizing and understanding the differences that exist between cultures. And again, when we look at culture as a set of shared values, as a set of world views that are shared across different categories, we know that even within America, the culture is not monolithic. The culture is not one, but again, that salad ball concept in which you have the pieces of so many different countries, backgrounds, cultures coming together. So what do we see as being different here in the U.S.? as opposed to many of maybe the cultures we came from back home, whatever back home might be in our minds. First, we recognize that for many of us, either we have immigrated to this country, our parents have immigrated, our grandparents have immigrated, or even as so many of the indigenous Muslims in America who preceded the colonization of America had ancestors that either migrated or were forced in migration here. So we know that for all intents and purposes, America was built as a country of Mahajirun. Just as at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who took that hijra, the muhajirun, who left Mecca and entered into al Medina, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first implemented the pact of brotherhood. That connection between brothers in which every muhajir was partnered with one from al-Ansar. And what was the purpose of this brotherhood? What was the purpose of this pact? It was so that those who were coming into the country who immigrated could learn from those who were already there, those from Mecca, a culture which was very business and trade oriented, could learn from those in Medina, a culture and a society that was much more agricultural. And we see differences in the women of the Meccan period and the women after migrating to Medina. We see differences in the interactions and we see that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam respected these differences and guided the muhajireen to learn from the Ansar. So we too need to learn rather than to turn away. We too need to see the good that exists in our identities as American Muslims and learn from that and teach our children to take that good as well. Now when we look at the differences in cultures, we utilize a system that is known as Hofstede's value dimensions. And these value dimensions look at five different areas in which there are cultural variations in how we interact with others. And if you've ever taken a compatibility counseling course with us at Cornerstone at our organization, you know that we utilize these dimensions as well to help us better understand the differing cultures between two individuals who are coming together for marriage. And they may have the same ethnic background, they may have the same racial background, they may come from the same country, their parents may come from the same country, but they still may have cultural differentiations because culture is the shared set of values. And if they're not shared, there can be differences. So what do we look at? One of the first aspects that we look at in terms of value dimensions is individualism versus collectivism. And we rate cultures on a scale of which culture tends to be highly individualistic and which culture tends to be highly collectivistic. We know that in our deen, as Muslims, the concept of the ummah is critical. We know that in our deen as Muslims, the concept of the family unit, of the togetherness, of the united aspect of moving forward, not just focusing on the nafs, is so critical and important. We also know that here in the U.S., there is a great deal of stress and focus on the individual. Our children are taught from a young age, be you, do you. Our children are taught from a young age in secular education, in popular culture, in that which surrounds them. To focus on the individual, to focus on the nafs, and to meet the needs of the basis self, of the nafs al-ammara. 
while we, from an Islamic perspective, may be guiding our children and focusing on elevating them to reach that pinnacle of the nafs al-mutma'inna, the contented self, the self that understands and recognizes what Islam and what Allah Azza wa Jal guides us towards. As Dr. Asif had mentioned previously, the limitations that we are given for our own good and the good of the ummah, and to recognize that, to accept it, to embrace it, and to reach the nafs al-mutma'inna. But this is not what our children are taught. This is not what the culture here in the U.S. tends to focus on because an individualistic culture focuses instead on the self, on that nafs. And so our children at home may be told the importance of being there for their family, taking care of their grandparents, being kind to their siblings, and they may be going to school and being told, look out for number one. And who are they taught is number one? Me. It's myself, right? And so there is this discrepancy that begins to develop within our children. Now we see that there are negative aspects of the individualism, but there is also some positives that we could learn from. For example, so many of us were truly, truly saddened by what happened just this past week in the elementary school in Texas, where 19 children were gunned down, where two teachers lost their lives, children just like our children, children that were dropped off in the morning by their parents, expecting full well to be taken care of for them to be safe, and children who will never hug those parents again, children who will never, in this dunya, be with their parents again. Now, we focused a great deal on the victims of the tragedy, but we also need to look at he who perpetuated that tragedy, the person who took the lives of these children, an 18-year-old, an 18-year-old who clearly had a great deal of issues, a predilection told, towards violence, who acted in a way that may truly align again with what that individualism can sometimes lead us to. That when we answer the call of the nafs al-ammara, then we are machine al hawa we are following our whims. That in a moment when I feel angry, I will act upon that anger. In a moment when I feel desire, and it matters not whether that desire is towards the halal or towards the haram, I will act upon that desire. In a moment when I feel an emotion on a whim, I will follow that emotion because I cater to my nafs. And this is a problem. And it's a problem that we need to address and to understand, but we don't address it and understand it by shielding our children and hiding them and covering their ears and say, don't listen to what's out there in society. Only focus on what's here. We don't shield them by taking away all devices and saying, you can't access anything. We shield them by having conversations. We shield them by talking to them, by educating them. Just yesterday, when we were in the bazaar, if you were here, and I believe it was in the afternoon yesterday, an alarm went off. And the alarm that kept blaring kept saying, move to the nearest exit, move to the nearest exit. And you know, mashallah, our community kept shopping. <laughs> so, alhamdulillah. But at our cornerstone booth, the booth that we have in the bazaar, in which we have some literature and information about mental health, about anxiety, about depression, we had several children coming up to us after the alarm, and alhamdulillah, it was a false alarm. We had several children coming up to us and saying, I was scared when that alarm went off. One child said, I didn't know what anxiety was before I came to this booth. Then you taught me what anxiety was, and when the alarm went off, I knew that that was anxiety, what I felt. These are conversations we need to have with our children. Children on the first day of the convention that were stopping by our booth and saying, did you hear about the shooting that just happened by the harbor? There was a shooting and two kids were shot. Our children are having these conversations. Our children know that in an individualistic society, people act upon their whims. Our children see this around them. They see the resulting violence. They see the resulting struggles and identity. They may experience it themselves. And this is where our collectivism must come and respond with the good, to sit with our children and have these conversations. Ask your children today, how do you feel about the shooting that occurred? 
What do you think caused it? How do you ensure that you are never in a position to act upon a whim, to act upon a desire, to act upon an emotion in a way that would harm yourself or harm others or displease Allah? Have these hard conversations with your children. Talk to them about anxiety and depression. Here in America, here in this culture, we do a lot of talking. We do a lot of talking with our children. We do a lot of conversating with them about different topics. Now imagine if we take the good of our deen, the beauty of our deen in terms of its guidance, and we convey that guidance in conversation rather than in a, this is halal and this is haram, and that's it. That's all you need to know. And this leads us to the next value dimension that we look at in terms of culture and cultural differentiation. The value dimension of power distance. Here in the U.S. culturally, we tend to be very low in terms of power distance. Yet for many of us from collectivist communities, for many of us from communities that are primarily Muslim faith-based, we see that the power distance is higher. Meaning here, a child is encouraged and taught to ask questions. A child is encouraged to talk and, and say what's on their mind. A child is encouraged to make direct eye contact and to speak whatever it is that comes to their mind regardless of the level of authority of the person they may be speaking to. And yet in our homes, we may implement a very high power distance. Don't talk when I'm talking. Don't ask questions, don't respond back. When you say, do this, and the child says, why? You respond with, because I said so. This high power distance that our children see in our homes completely goes against what they are seeing in their schools when they are encouraged to ask questions, to talk, to, to explore. It is this difference in terms of power distance that when our children go off to college and they sit in that philosophy class in their freshman year that they are required to take and the professor says, I want to hear your thoughts. And the professor begins to lead them down a path saying, what is God? Who is God? Let's talk about it. Let's dissect it. And the child has simply grown up in a household where they are told, do this, don't do that. Where they are told, Islam, is the halal and the haram, where there hasn't been a love nurtured for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the God-centric nature of leading towards the nafs al-mutma'inna has not been taught in that philosophy class, we often lose our children. We lose our children because now they are in a position of low power distance where they are being encouraged to talk, they are being encouraged to think but that thinking is being guided by that which is other than Islam. And so it is incumbent upon us to create within our households a recognition and an understanding of what our children are up against in terms of the power distance outside in society and to begin to envelope within our own homes a sense of development of critical thinking. A guiding of our children where we don't just tell them pray, pray, pray. You're going to go to Jahannam if you don't pray. And instead, we guide them with love, with understanding, with compassion, and with explanation and conversation. And we tell them when you enter into your salah, you are entering into a conversation with your creator. And who is your creator? Your creator, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Your creator, Al-Wadud, the one who loves you more than any human love is capable of comprehending your creator you are right now entering into a conversation with the one who you will answer to now imagine if we guide our children to see their salah in that way rather than having them see it in the way of a strict order do this and that's it Imagine how much better equipped they will be when they enter into that freshman year philosophy class. When we teach them not just to memorize the Qur'an, but to live the Qur'an, and to live the Qur'an in the way that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a picture, an epitome of the walking Qur'an. Now as we move forward in those differences of value dimensions, we see that the next value dimension that we look to is the one on contextualization. 
And contextualization is linked back to whether someone tends to be highly contextual within their culture or lower on the scale of contextualism. Contextualization refers to our nonverbal cues. Many of us maybe have children who when we tell them, you know, uh, did you do this? Yeah. How was your day? Fine, right? Verbal short blurts, right? Their texting language has become a verbalization, right? Rather than laughing, they say LOL, right? And if they could answer you in an emoji, they probably would. And this is because here in the US, we tend to be lower on the contextualism scale, but as Muslims, we tend to be higher in contextualism. So we may be sitting with our children, and we may say something, and we may look at the expression on their face and say, don't look at me like that. And the child's like, what? I didn't look at you anyway, right? And yet there is something nonverbal that is going on there. So understanding the contextualism, understanding also the impact of how we say things, not just what we say, and how important it is for us to be in tune of how we say things. You know, I often reference in the marriage talks and the family talks the verses of Surah Al-Rum. And we often refer to verse 21, which is considered the marriage verse in which Allah Azza wa Jal guides us towards having mawadda wa rahmah, care and mercy in our relationships. But these verses within Surah Al-Rum are essentially like a series that must be taken in context. And when we start with verse 20 of Surah Al-Rum and go down to verse 24, an entire story of communication is written for us. Because in those verses, Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us that he has, been creating, uh, he has created us as humans who have dispersed through the land. That we are different and we are coming from different cultures, different backgrounds. And then it is a miracle, right? That he has brought us together. And each of those ayahs ends with a different reminder of the miracle in bringing us together. He has brought us together as mates, as husbands and wives. And the verse that follows that is a verse that reminds us that there are differences. That there is differences in our colors. And differences in our tongue. And the verse that follows us, that one reminds us in the end of it, Allah Azza wa Jal is reminding us in those verses, you are different. You are different from your children, you are different from your neighbors, you are different from the society that you live in, just as the Muhajireen from Mecca were different from the Ansar in Medina. But that doesn't mean that our differences need to divide us. It doesn't mean that our differences should pull us apart. It means that we learn from those differences. And we learn how to live with one another in those differences and to raise our children with an understanding of those differences. So we got to the third value dimension, I believe. We talked about individualism and collectivism and power distance and contextualism. Another value dimension that we see that is differentiated here in the US from a lot of the cultures that we carry with us with an Islamic perspective is the concept of uncertainty avoidance. And we see that here in the US, there tends to be a higher uncertainty avoidance, whereas the Muslim perspective tends to have a lower uncertainty avoidance. What does that mean? For individuals that come from a Muslim background, for us practicing our Muslim faith, very often when someone says, what are we going to do? Or our children, maybe they say, mom, I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. And our response might be, inshallah. And what's the follow-up response from our kids? But when, inshallah, right? When, inshallah? And this is just a small example of the differences of how we can be comfortable when we are grounded in our Muslim faith in that sense of tawakkul, in trusting Allah, in recognizing that there may not be a set pattern, that Allah is the best of all planners, but our children are up against a society that is telling them, no, know what you're doing today, know what you're doing tomorrow, know what you're doing five minutes from now. And so we are trying to find that balance in guiding our children through that dichotomy that they may be facing. And the last value dimension that we address is the value dimension of time, the monochronic versus the polychronic. For many of us, the concept of being monochronic is implemented in our day-to-day -day lives in that, for example, you know, we have an 11 o'clock lecture, we're gonna be here at like 10.30, right? We have a, a program to go to, we have school to attend, but some of us may also be polychronic, 
where there is fluidity in our time, where we tell someone, meet me at 8 o'clock by the booth, and you kind of show up by 8.30, by 9, not out of a place of disrespect, but coming from a place of prioritizing the activity. You are having a good conversation with someone. The shawarkamis were on sale in one of the booths and you really needed to get one. And so we focus on the activity rather than the time. Now our natural fitra, the way that Allah Azza wa Jal has created us, is to be more polychronic. Clocks are man-made. And yet, that guidance that Allah Azza wa Jal gives us is finding that balance. Hence our salah, is monochronic. There are specific times for our salah and yet within those times there is still fluidity that we know when the adhan for dhuhr goes off at one o'clock we should answer that call of prayer immediately. But we also know that there is time and there is a little time for us to be able to make it before salat al-asr to pray salat al-dhuhr. Yet how many times with our children do we take a monochronic approach and we tell them get up and pray. And the child is like, okay, five more minutes. Get up and pray. Five more minutes, five more minutes, right? In that tug of war, our children are exemplifying their polychronic leanings and we are pushing them towards a monochronic adulthood. But imagine if rather than thinking that our children will give us instant obedience, which leads to what we are seeing in terms of a culture of instant gratification, Right? When we expect that we say jump and our children say how high, then when our children experience things that they want or that they are desiring, they are also going to expect an instant gratification, whether it's from their younger siblings, whether it's from their parents, whether it's from their friends, or just answering their own nafs and desires. So finding that balance having that conversation, telling our children, you know, the adhan for dhuhr just went off. And I know that you're playing this game right now, but the salah is important. And Allah Azza wa Jal can't wait to hear your conversation with him. When do you think you'll finish up this game so that we can make it to salah together? Imagine if we had that conversation with our children. Imagine if we guide them and allow them to critically think. Imagine if we give them ownership of their deen, of their identity. Imagine if we begin to understand and recognize that, that the differences in our cultures do exist. That there are some elements that we will encounter as Americans, as American Muslims that we may need to navigate through, that we may need to understand. But there is always also great good. The great good that exists in the diversity that we see here in the US, many times in the country of origin that many of us may have come from, we see rampant racism. We see such a, almost a, a similitude of the way that individuals look, the way they act, the food they eat that there becomes this fear of that which is different. And here in the US, alhamdulillah, we've developed an understanding of that which is different. But there's still some fear sometimes. The fear of losing our children, the fear of our children losing their identities, the fear of us losing what is most important to us, which is the God-centric focus on Allah Azza wa Jal. But brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, don't ever parent from a place of fear. Don't ever practice your deen from a place of fear. Practice it from a place of love. Parent from a place of love. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal guides us towards. To be able to practice that parenting from a place of love. And practicing from a place of love does not mean that we don't discipline. It means that we seek to understand. It means that we listen. It means that we learn the tongues of our children. It means that we learn the tongues of our community so that we can understand. And in that process of understanding, in that process of seeking knowledge, then we begin to articulate and be able to respond to what it is that surrounds us. So I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal guides us all as parents, as community members, as leaders to listen more, to conversate more, to be able to have those difficult talks with our children, to address the societal norms that we're seeing around us and present our deen 
Our love of our faith and our following of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the solution to so many societal ills, because truly it is. But first, we must understand it. We must know it. We must act upon it. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal guides our children through these rough waters and these difficult times that we see currently and that are yet to come. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal protects them and allows them to maintain their deen, maintain their identity, and return to what it means to be a Muslim American, strong in faith, strong in action, and a strong example and role model for our communities. Jazakumallahu khair.